What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the After Effect Podcast Show. I am your host, LeBron Stephan. Would you call me LBZ, L Boogie, Big Brown, 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 B Ron, LB, Bronny, the choice is yours. Welcome to episode 80. We have a very, very, very special guest. DJ Lester is on the podcast today. Utah native, played his college football at Wyoming, where he was a mainstay at receiver, went undrafted in 2012, NFL draft, and played six years of arena football. We played together in 2013 for the Green Bay Blizzard. DJ wrote a book titled Fostering Dreams in 2017, which got rave reviews on Amazon. Go, go check that out whenever you get a chance. I'm super excited to hear DJ's After Effect and hear um, what he's up to now. So just send him the link and once he jumps on, we will go. And- Good with you, bro. What's good with you, man? It's good to see you. It's been a long time. You know, right? It's a crazy, yes, crazy, crazy, man. Life, yeah, man. Crazy, <laughs> you know, you know, life be life. Man. <laughs> but, um, hey, but yeah, man, I appreciate you joining, man. This is called um the After Effects show. I started it almost two years ago. Um, it, it's all it, it was always my belief that all of us athletes, you know, anybody that played division one or even division two or division one double A for that matter, we all have an after effect or aftershock. From our athletic journey, you're talking about a 10 to 20 year relationship, depending on when you started playing. And I've always felt like, um, you know, guys that don't particularly make it or have those illustrious 10, 15 year careers. Um, you know, so a lot of times those guys don't don't have a voice. You know, they, they kind of get forgotten about, man. So this is a free and safe space for us to kind of like relive our journey and uh, uh, try to push the culture forward. Yeah, most definitely, man. Like I said, yeah, it's it's crazy. Like you said, when you hit me, I was like, man, you know what I mean? I'm like, okay, you got something because <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. I've been thinking about the same thing because, you know, obviously I wrote a book. Obviously, I yeah, like, Foster and Dreams back in 2017. So you kind of been on that wave <laughs> of, story, of storytelling. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. So like that kind of, you know what I'm saying, like put me in perspective, like, hey, maybe I need to write about the after effects of football, you know, because there's a lot of lessons that we kind of endure all of us, you know what I mean? Like exactly. for the after world, after sports, because everybody has that bigger picture, the NFL and stuff like that. But, you know, exactly. so that in my mind. So yeah, I'm thinking about writing a second book. So that was always on the top of my mind. So okay. Me, oh, okay. The after effect. And I was like, I was literally just thinking about the same thing. That's why I hit you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 man. Um, Yeah, I got the idea back in like 2019, but I, you, you know how we do. I sat on it for a while, just, you know, nervous or scared, whatever the case may be to, to, to just launch it. Then when, when the pandemic hit, I just said, F it, man. Just figure out, you know, figure things out as I go, man. So um, I just got two current events. Now, when we played together in 2013, I remember you had bounce. So have you been following the uh, the NBA, like the, the NBA championship? Have you been following yeah, it all? Or, okay. Yeah, but the outside watch game one and things like that. Too. Yeah, who you – so who you, who you got taking it? Man, this – boy, I tell you, it's going to be a good series, man. Like I said, yeah. the Boston went in and stole game one. So, man, like just – my thing is like the way Boston have been playing, the way they've been contributing, like people coming off the bench. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, man. Yeah. The main thing, the main thing I think is, oh, will they be able to sustain that from how they play game one? Will they be yeah. able to play like that every game? Will the best players be able to step up like that? Obviously, Tatum going to play better. You, you know, he had 14 um, assists, but he's going to get more points. You're going to get more production from him. But will the Warriors continue to miss shots, and will the Celtics continue to you know be that consistent and get those contributions from other players? I, I mean, I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> I, just, I don't know. Like I said, you never know. Like, even when we played, you know, like, everything is always about what the game entails. You know what I mean? I was like, Tatum, like, when he was struggling shooting-wise, what do you do? He contributed with assist-wise and things like that. So, right. I feel like you can't, with him not scoring that amount, like, I don't feel like they can sustain that. Because, you know what I mean? Like, everybody's on and off, so you never know. But right. my biggest thing is, like, I know the Warriors are going to come back for revenge. You know what I mean? They're going to smell blood and go get that. Because Steph Curry, boy, that boy came out. Psh, 21 the first quarter. Yeah, so he was I sniping. thought he was going to end up with 50. He only ended up with like 34, 35. Yeah, so I thought he was going to come out sniping. So, I mean, like, I'm 
like I said, I was, we always talk about we respect greatness and things like that too. Mm-hmm. So my thing is like I know Boston did what they had to do game one, but I feel like you know Golden State gonna come back and have to. You know, oh yeah, play. yeah. I'm man, I'm I'm excited. I'm excited to watch it. Um, last 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 kind of current event. Uh, we are about twenty four, about twenty eight months removed from when COVID was announced, like March twelfth, twenty twenty. Um, so obviously, you know, we had, we've had to adjust and pivot in certain ways. So how did you kind of find yourself having to grow, um, spiritually, emotionally, physically, obviously we've never had to walk through a coronavirus pandemic. We've never had to wear masks. The world has never shut down since we've been alive. So like, just kind of walk me through your process when it was announced, like, did your, did your, um, daily life change at all? Did you have to pivot in any ways? Just, you know, how have you adjusted to what we call life now? Um, man when COVID hit obviously like the world just shut down basically you know everything yeah. slowed down for everybody and then, and at that time I felt like because everybody was just moving going here doing this doing that going to work like no everybody was thinking about the important things I felt like that kind of slowed everybody down like hey look okay we need to focus on what's important which is the family aspect of everything the people that are around us and stuff like that mm-hmm. so for me when COVID hit like obviously I was working with juvenile kids uh youth you know what I'm saying so like you know be mentoring things like that to them so that kind of slowed down a little bit because a lot of kids didn't come to that program we had basically because of COVID mm-hmm. right um, so my life kind of slowed down a little bit but for me that kind of made things a little bit harder um because my background like I said a lot of people have you know, people they could depend on, like family. So I have people I can depend on and stuff like that too. But like that, that original family core, like your blood family line, you know what I mean? I don't really have that. So okay. for me, like I was doing a lot of stuff of like traveling and trying to figure out life with no support, no help. Like, you know what I mean? So yeah, it, it really changed life for me a lot because it forced me to buckle down and have like grind, you know what I mean? <laughs> and yeah. Everybody grind because like that. So a lot of things that happened then, like even like, you know, um, with things it just kind of just changed my whole perspective just kind of like basically made my life a little bit different you know like absolutely this life was different like that too because you know when COVID hit like everybody had to change a lot of things you couldn't just wake up and just go do the same thing you did you couldn't get exactly on- you, you know, had to change your routine the jams ones that wasn't open nothing was really open <laughs> and a lot yeah. of people that was for them like that was a culture shock basically because like people exactly. Routine, you know what I mean? Like that's where our humans were used to routine. So like now, when you got a shock to change your routine, it's like, okay, what do I do now? So right. I felt like a lot of people didn't have that thought process or think worst case scenario. I was like, if this happened, what would I do when this occurred? So exactly, but, yeah, it was just like I said, it was life changing, and and I know like you know there was a lot of changes that happened, but it forced me to learn a lot. It forced mm-hmm. me to value things or the people that around your circle. Definitely. Uh, me to reach out to certain individuals that I didn't talk to in a while, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? So even mm-hmm. people on a football journey, so it kind of like brought a lot of people closer and some people further away, you know, so. Mm-hmm. Um, oh man, I- yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I can totally attest to that. I had to pivot in a lot of different ways. Like you said, um, you had so much downtime, it really made you uh, reassess your core group of friends uh, and, you know, kind of remove some people if needed or, you know, maybe add some people. I definitely may maybe like tap in with more family members. Just because you know, uh, you know, there, there were there was people passing away from COVID and all those kinds of things, man. So definitely make you made you look at life life different and just tighten up, you know, on some things because you just don't know, you know, how much longer you got or you know how long. As you can see, COVID's still here. The, the, the numbers are back rising now. Here, so I'm back wearing my mask at the grocery store, just everywhere, man. So it's it's, it's we we've kind of had to adapt. I think us as athletes and us as football players, we've been doing that our whole life. You got to adapt in practice, adapt on the field, change game plans, all that. So, so that that kind of made us more equipped, you know, to adapt um, as opposed to you know your your normal person who doesn't really have an athletic background. Um, think, you know, nothing against them. And I think to add to that too, I think because the biggest thing was like how we grew up. You know, what I'm saying when the generation we came about was like we were forced to do things like go outside, do this. You know, what I'm saying like approach things hands on. You know, what I'm saying exactly. now it's like kids just have everything to their disposal. So like when COVID hit to them, it's like. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I'm just sitting on my tablet all day, but like, they don't understand what, you know what I'm saying? Like, exactly, exactly. Uh, grew up outside, drank from the water hose, like, you know what I'm saying? Shoot, exactly. Football without pads, like, you know what I mean? All that, you know, what I mean? <laughs> yeah. you know, so it made exactly. us agree. Uh, I mean, we, when COVID hit, it was like for us, it was like, oh, we used to adapt it, you know what I mean? We exactly, started. exactly. No, that's that, that, I love that because I always said it on every one of my episodes, that's actually a great segue um, to, to, to your childhood. And so I was, I always say like, I'd be feeling old when I say like, man, you know, we didn't grow up like the kids now. We didn't have internet. We didn't have YouTube. We didn't have camera phones. Uh, you Like, like I, I always felt like it was a more interactive world like in the nineties because you had to go outside and play Dino Man or any bounce, come up, hide and seek, come up with games, be creative. 
you, you come in when the street lights come on, but you, you didn't have all that stuff. And even when the internet came out in 97, 98, you had to have money to even be able to afford a PC and, and, and dial up internet. So I, we didn't get a computer till like maybe oh three or four, you know what I mean? So like, I mean, I learned a little bit about the computer at school, but um, you know, if, if you wasn't really fortunate like that, you still didn't really have no computer or no access to those kind of things. You know what I mean? So um, I read that you, so did you grow up in uh, Ephraim, Utah or Layton, Utah? Bro, like I, I've been all over the place. My story is very, is very crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and and obviously you can allude to certain things and then certain things that you may not want to talk about, that's fine. But I did read, you know, that you, the, the book Foster and James came from um, you being in the foster system and abuse growing up. So just yeah. kind of like paint me a picture just on what your upbringing was like. Maybe you don't have to like give grave details if you don't want to, but um, just uh, like paint me a picture maybe from, you know, grade school to you finally going to Layton Christian High School. Okay. Um, so my story, like I said, is very, very unique. So um, I was born in Columbus, Ohio. You know what I'm saying? So um, my mother and my, my sperm donor, and I say that because there's certain milestones for me as a kid that a father's supposed to be there for her kids. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. you know, every father knows, like I'm a father right now, so I know what it feels like to give back to kids and stuff. So uh, when I was growing up, so my mother and father kind of met, like had me in Ohio. Uh, my mother found out that my my adoptive dad, I mean, my uh, my sperm donor was married and he had two other kids with another wife, but it was in the process of divorce. But then, you know, they had me basically. Okay. Uh, and so when she found out about stuff like that, his other wife and things like that. So she said, no, like I'm going to leave. So my mother's Nigerian. Okay. So, her family's from Nigeria. So when I was about one and a half, almost two years old, you know, she took me back to Nigeria with her, you know? Mm. So I spent the from one and a half to 10 years old, that whole childhood in Nigeria. In okay. Culture, speaking wow. nine different dialects, the cuisine, just everything. Wow. Okay. Culture, basically. Yeah. Um, like, and life out there was basically good in a sense because it made me appreciate the value of having less. You know? Okay. Okay. You know how you go in the shower right now, you turn the faucet on and the water will hit you, whatever. Back right. in that period, we didn't have that. You know what I mean? No, there wow. a warm water. You had to fetch water from a well or whatever. You put it on the fire to have a warm shower. That's how yeah. you shower. You know what wow, I'm saying? Wow, yeah. wow, wow. So okay. Like bottom, bottom. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, there. it made you appreciate, um, like, like U.S. living. Yeah, That's basically. Different. Yeah, so, okay. Um, I spent, like I said, those 10 years, like, that was, like, the, the best time I had in my life because I appreciate the value of having less but you know appreciate that i have more so. yeah well like what what were the people like in nigeria were they like more loving did they not because you know you know things are so on the surface here in the united states people yeah. people are so fake they act like they care they really don't um but i know even back then you know we didn't have really have access to technology like that so it was more so just like kind of like a loving environment creative environment yeah it was i mean it was loving because you gotta understand not everybody out there is what they is they are i mean as far as the government the government is very corrupt basically okay. but people from the town and village that i grew up in it was like everybody was friendly we always help each other out you know what mm -hmm. i mean mm -hmm. neighbors it's like you know like you run neighborhood people are like, oh yeah i know this person yeah, well, yeah. like back to how we grew up exactly you know, I walk in your house basically like call your mom mom you know what i'm saying exactly like, <laughs> you right. know I mean? we walk in everybody take care of everybody okay so I'm not saying like if the, the environment was always perfect, but just like any environment that you have the bad people, you got the good people, stuff like that too. Mm -hmm. So that's just how it was. You know what I mean? People help each other are friendly. Um, but there was a lot of, you know, people just being corrupt because everybody want to win. You know right, what I mean? right, right. I got you. Yeah. Were, basically. So okay. I grew up those 10 years, um, just living life, doing what I had to do, doing the best I could, you know, living with less, you know, mm -hmm. like you didn't have free uh, TVs, we didn't have game systems, we didn't have anything. So we played outside, you know, you right. Fire, you you play, you know what I'm saying? You you play mangoes, you ate cashews, you ate everything. And that's another thing I'm gonna talk to you about too. You do you know do you know what a cashew is? Uh the only cashew I know is like a like a like a nut, like a peanut. Okay. Yeah, I'm a, when you get off when we get off this interview over right now, eventually I want you to Google what a cashew is. There's actual okay. cashew fruit that the nut comes from, and then the oh. nut is served now. Like I'm okay. Google it. Okay. Everybody's listening too. Make sure y'all Google what a cashew is. Definitely. Was. Okay. Okay. I, I, I never even knew that. <laughs> yeah. You're saying you're going to learn something today. So right, right, right. <laughs> so I grew up eating a cashew. A cashew is like, it's like a peach. It's like soft like that. The skin texture is like that. You bite into it. It's so sweet, so juicy. But if you get on your shirt, it'll stain you. But I grew up eating that in Nigeria. Okay. You know, goes, everything like that. So like just all the fruits, all the junk like that. So it was, it was like the best, like 10 years of my life, basically. Right, right, right. Okay. When I got to 10 years old, 
Um, my sperm donor came back in a picture, you know what I'm saying? Like telling me, hey, like, you know, I want a relationship with you again. I want you to come to the United States. You know? Okay. So plans were made. I ran away from home for about a couple of weeks because I didn't want to leave my mom because that's all I knew. You know right. I mean? For um, all those years, yeah. Yeah, so like, you know, I have built a bond with my mom and everything. And so um, at 10 years old, I flew back to the United States, you know, by myself. I had like an escort and landed. And uh, at the time we landed in Utah. And um, so when I got to Utah, my doc, I mean, my, my sperm donor was supposed to pick me up from the airport, but his girlfriend picked me up from the airport. This is a new girlfriend that he had. Mm -hmm. So, I so he had moved from Ohio to Utah. Yes, basically. Okay. So, um, so I didn't really know who she was, like, you know what I'm saying? But me as a kid, 10 year old kid coming from Nigeria, predominantly all you see is African-American people. You might see a couple of white people, but I just never saw color basically, you know what I mean? Right. Just what it was. So everything was just a culture shock for me. So I landed, she took me to, it was like called the Desert Industries, the DI, and bought me one of them fat, clear Game Boys you can see through the technology with the Mario, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that, that was like one of the first, yeah, yeah. yeah that was that like was one of the first definitely. technologies. Yeah. yeah, so I got that, and she took me to McDonald's. That was the first food I ate when I landed and stuff like that. So, uh, so like, everything was just a shock. And then me, like, being in the store, I'm like, dang, like, we never had none of this in Nigeria. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, y'all living good up here, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I stayed with her for about a week, and then about a week later, I went to go stay with my do uh, my sperm donor at the time at his house. Um, and then, so we lived in a two-bedroom apartment. And uh, so this was third grade. You know, like I told you, the way my memory, like, works is I remember everything. So third grade. Mm -hmm. Me too. Uh, so I was going to school in and out, and that's when, like, the abuse started. You know what I mean? Okay. Like, you treat me like I was an object. Um, I'd get hit with bamboo sticks. I'd get smacked with paws. And, like, basically anything he could get his hands on, basically, just to, you know, because he didn't like everything I was doing. But, like, I didn't do anything, you know? So okay. Um, I remember February 15th, 1999, and uh, I was part of this after-school program. Um, I was supposed to be, you know, going home after, after 5 o'clock, get out of the building so they could lock the school up or whatnot. And mm -hmm. uh, I was trying to walk home, but... I heard some people shouting, you know, some things like, oh, you N-word, da, da, da. So I ran back into school and I told my teacher, you know what I mean? So she called my daughter and my sperm donor, like, hey, come pick your son up from school. He told her no. He cursed her on her phone, like literally just cursed her on her phone. She said, if you don't come pick up your son, we're going to report him as abandoned and neglected. He said, I don't care. Mm. So a lot of cops, the police officer came to the school February 15th, took me home to our apartment, the two-bedroom apartment. We get there. And uh, so he yanked me in the house. Like, you know what I mean? Once the officer was talking to the sir, like, you're going to have to watch how you treat your son. He's like, I don't care. He's my son. I can treat him however I want to. Mm -hmm. Right in front of the officer. So he yanked me in the house. And uh, so he, that's when the abuse started. He started smacking me, beating me. I'm running around the apartment screaming, stop, 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 stop. But I don't know, for whatever reason it was, the police officer was still stayed there by the door. And um, so, you know. That yeah, was I hate that, man. That's how it was in the 90s. Like, yeah, like it was kind of like we didn't like. You know how the kids have a voice now. Like they'll like go on social media or they'll 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 tell somebody. But it was like in the 90s, we was kind of kind of like afraid to say anything. Like if that, you know, and even at the police being there, and he still didn't come in and intervene. Like, yeah, 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 that's how it was. So I went through that. And so like I said, he told me to get in the shower. I washed all the blood off and whatnot. So the officer said he's not going to anyone until you saw me. So I came out with just a towel on, you know what I'm saying? Like he had me do like a little turnaround, like just make sure I didn't have no scars or whatever. So I was left home that night and then I got beat up that night after he left. And then, uh, so the next day I remember going to school. Like I remember this day like no other, my memory is just so vivid. So I walked into school, I, you know, I got buzzing in the intercom DJ reported principal's office. And so I walked in, I saw a bunch of people like name place, name badges. So I'm like, what the heck going on? You know what I'm saying? I'm scared. Like, okay, I've never been around so many people. Mm -hmm. and people in the back of my mind, I'm just thinking about my mom. You know what I'm saying? I was like, I want to talk to my mom, but I hadn't talked to my mom since I landed or anything. Yeah. And, She's still in Nigeria. Yeah, she's still in Nigeria. And so all that went about. Um, and then so they called me to put me in the room. Like the lady, Justine, was like, hey, like, you know, hey, I, I want you, I want to talk to you. All these scars you got on your body. Every time I keep asking, you keep saying you fell from jungle gym or you tripped from soccer or something like that. But I feel like there's something more. And I was like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. You know what I'm saying? Like, get mm -hmm. on line, line, line. And then she, I remember she told me, she was like, hey, like, you're a child that deserves to be happy. You know what I mean? Deserves to play, have fun, do things what little boys do. And she said, what do you want? And as soon as she said that, I said, my mama. And then that's when she knew she had me. You know what I'm saying? She said, well, what is it going to take to get your mama? I said, I don't know. Like, yeah, you know, right. Oh, we're going to figure it out. So she started talking to my sperm donor about it, but he wouldn't help out with the process or whatever. And so I ended up getting placed in foster care at that particular moment. So I went through foster care for like six years, bounced home and home. Like, you know, people use me for money for government, got blamed for everything. I got so many stories in the foster care system. You know what I mean? Like went home, it was like, 
as a foster kid, you go to each people's each, uh, different homes, but like you have to respect people's rules because everybody has different rules in the home. You know what I mean? Of course, of course, yeah. I was very reserved because I'm like, I don't want to mess anything up. You know what I mean? Right. I don't want to yell that, but I got blamed for everything. So um, my family, which is my last name now, the Lester's, my mom, she had read my story through the foster care system. She's like, oh, I want my son to come home. Like, word for it. That's exactly what she said. Mm. And so I was like, oh, okay. So they came out there and visited me in one of the homes I was in. And she's like, yeah, I want him to come, you know, come stay with us or whatnot. And so that's how the process kind of happened. So I stayed with them. Um, and then, so well, meanwhile, all those years, I had not spoken to my mother. I spoke to my mother one time on the phone while I was at D elementary school. And uh, mm. so I talked to her on the phone a little bit in our native tongue or whatnot. And that was it. And so all those years passed by. Um, I'm dealing with everything, going through, you know, like middle school. Um, people would call me dumb, call me stupid, call me retarded. Cause it was just a language barrier you know what i mean like i'll ask mm. questions and stuff like that but like there's all oh, you dumb see teachers would literally put me in the corner of classrooms i'll raise my hand ask some questions i'll stop asking questions okay cool so i just mm. don't care anymore you know what i mean i'm like i'm trying to like learn and understand what i got going on like i came from all different country but i'm trying to communicate but i can't communicate mm. and um so it was like the hardest challenge in my life you know i got bullied i got talked about i got called darky i got i got everything you know what i mean so as a kid you know like you know a lot of people bullied like they just take advantage of the opportunity yeah man it used to be real bad back then like before camera phones and all that yeah but we had a tough skin back then you know what i mean that's what yeah, they, yeah. Just, you, know you what had mean? to get through that you just had to get through that shit for real <laughs> you can't do that so went through that and then uh so um, the summer before my freshman year, you know, after like I fought a lot, um, plans were made, uh, which my basketball coach is about to retire now after 20 years, but um, I got sent to a private school, Lane Christian Academy. And uh, mm -hmm. so it's kind of like a little change for me from public school because I fought a lot. I just gave up because teacher was calling me stupid. I got placed in special ed classes. I got called dumb that I'll never amount to anything in life, all the junk like that. So I just, you know what I mean? I was like, whatever. So I got placed in private school, which was smaller classes. So they could try to focus on like trying to teach me everything I need to learn. Mm -hmm. Um, so the freshman before uh, my fr uh, the summer before my freshman year comes about and uh, my sperm donor comes back in the picture, you know, what I mean, like, oh, hey, son, like, I'm gonna start doing everything to go to court. So I want you back. And uh, so we went to court, we was in and out of court every single day or every couple of weeks or whatnot. And the judge would always talk to me, like, hey, what do you want? What do you want? I said, I want my mama. You know, what I mean, so they was trying to figure things out my, my sperm donor. And um, so the summer before my freshman year, like I gave him another opportunity. The judge asked me, like, do you want to give him a chance? I said, okay, cool. You know, so plans were made for that summer for me to go fly to New Jersey in Brunswick, New Jersey to go stay with him for the summer of 2003. And uh, so when I landed there- Yeah, he was moving around, Ohio to Utah to Jersey. Yeah, okay. all over the place, bro. So all <laughs> over the place. That's why I said my, when I asked earlier, I told you I'm from all over the place. Yeah, bro. yeah, okay, I got you. Yeah, it makes sense now. Yeah, so went to New Jersey. So I flew out there to New Jersey. And um, so after that, um, I landed at the airport. You know what I mean? The day he's supposed to pick me up, the man didn't even show up to the airport. I literally had to scrunch up some chains at the time, use the pay phone and call him on the phone. I dialed a number six, I'm like, you know what I mean? All that junk. I call him on the phone and literally all I could tell the man is like, I'm here. He's like, where? I said, the airport. It took him about like two hours to get to the airport in New Jersey. Mm. And uh, so he had a one bedroom apartment and he had set like a little area sectioned off with a bookshelf in the living room for me to sleep on the floor and at the time i had a playstation 2 so think about how, how far back that was yeah that was. <laughs> i had a playstation 2 so i just kind of set it up and that was what i did and the time difference from utah at the time to new jersey was about you know saying three hours so yeah like, yeah three hours yeah. yeah yeah so like i would stay up a little bit later to about like two or three in the morning and then you know saying sleep a little bit later to compensate that yeah and so he used that as like an alibi um and then he told me oh yeah well, let's go see your mom and I just, oh, dang, my mom, he used that as an alibi. And then, uh, so I remember, he was like, well, we got to go. I remember one morning I woke up, my belongings were packed. And he's like, we're going to see your mom. And that was it. So I was like, well, I got to call my adopted parents and let them know where I'm going to be. He's like, no. He like snatched me up, like, you know, like, no, bring up. I'm like, oh, so I'm like, okay, I'll find a way to call my, you know, adopted parents at some point. We get to the airport. We fly to Lagos, Nigeria. And uh, hmm. we and they lost our luggage and most people don't know what Lagos, Lagos is some people do you know what I mean but we landed in Nigeria and Lagos which is the capital I think Abuja is the capital now though but um at the time it was Lagos and uh so we get there we land lost our luggage but now meanwhile I spent all these years think about it from 1998 to 2003 I spent all these years in Nigeria for 10 so I spoke the dialect the cuisine all the junk like that so all those yeah. years in the United States I forced myself to learn English right Right now you like 15, 16. It's been yeah. like six years. It's been like six years. Yeah. So now they're only talking to my mother one time on the phone. 
And uh, so all that junk happened. And uh, so we land, like, so I'm trying to figure out everything. So it was like basically like putting a puzzle piece together. Like, like you, when, when you don't speak your dialect, your language, you basically lose it. You know what I mean? But like, mm. I was remembering certain words, what certain things mean. So I was trying to puzzle like the conversations together in my head, right. you, you right. know, talking about this, whatever. And uh, so we went um, to where my grandpa's complex was, my mom, my mother's dad. Um, so we got on this little, it's called the Okada. It's like motorcycles transportation. It's like a taxi, but like you ride on motorcycles. Or whatever. Okay. And um, so we get to my grandpa's complex. So I hopped off the motorcycle. I'm excited. Like just a kid, 14, like, oh my God, you know what I'm saying? Summer before my first meet, I'm excited. I got to see my mama. I yeah. see her all these years, you know what I'm saying? Right. I talked to her one time. Okay, cool. So I'm looking around like, I'm like the first person should have greeted me off that motorcycle was my mama. You know what I'm saying? And so everybody was like, oh no, she's over here. She's taking care of a couple of people because she was a nurse. And so I'm like, okay, well, dang, like my mom, she'd have been here. You know what I'm saying? I'm excited as a kid. Mm -hmm. And so when I landed there, my grandpa went to a funeral. And so I went up and met up with him. Like you could just see how his eyes just lit up because he ain't seen me since I was a jit, since I was 10. That was my right hand man. Mm -hmm. He told me, yeah, your mom's here. Da -da -da. I'm like, okay, cool. So a couple of days that passed, I'm still like getting infuriated. Like where my mom at? You know what I'm saying? So a couple of days passed, you still haven't had a center? Yeah, I still hadn't seen her. A couple mm. of days passed. And so they had like a funeral burial for that lady that passed away the day I got there. And uh, so they took me to her porch and sat me down. And uh, so I'm sitting down with a you know group of people, you know, my, my my grandpa's people and all this stuff like that. And they pulled me aside and it was like, hey, like, come here, son. I'm like, what? So then I started like growing suspicious in my head. Like, what is going on? Like, why are we sitting here? Like, y'all should figure out where my mom is. My mom should be here, like right now. Like, you know what I'm right. saying? Right. And so they was like, hey, son, like you're gonna have to be strong, man. I'm like, what? They said, your mother had passed away a year after you came to the United States. Lost it just dropped down, like lost it. Cause that was the biggest loss of my life ever. You know what I'm saying? Because I talked to my mother one time, but the hardest lesson I took from now was like, my mother had taught me everything she could in life. But the one thing she couldn't teach me is how to live life without her. You know what I mean? And that's right. hard. Cause I was like, damn, like that was my right hand man. The person. So, so she basically passed when he was like 11. Yeah. So and I didn't and you didn't even know, nobody told you. Yeah. My, my, my sperm donor knew about it, but he didn't tell me about it. He used that as an alibi to take me back to Nigeria. And then, so here's a stipulation though. So, so why, I, why did he wait all those years to take you back if he knew? Cause he was tired of paying money for the system and stuff like that for all the, you know what I'm saying? Cause I was in the foster care system. Yeah. So he used that as an alibi to get me back to Nigeria. And then he flew back to uh, to United States, took my passport, took my school ID. He took everything, just left me there basically. Just wow. Oh, he flew back alone. Yeah, he flew back wow. alone. Wow, damn. Me. You know what I'm saying? Crazy, right? So it took me two and a half months. I had to go to the American Embassy. Um, you know, obviously, like everybody, you know, you know, everybody comes there saying they're a citizen, da da da. Yeah. So I get a phone or whatever. I talked to my doctor, mom, and PR. I called her on the phone. I remember the conversation like no other. Hey, mom, like da da. Oh, where you at? I'm in Nigeria. Oh, we thought so. We had the police looking for you in the United States, and da da da. They had a warrant for his for his arrest and everything like that. So I dealt with that process. Went about two and a half months, um, and then I got back to to Salt Lake in uh, October. So I had missed like the start of my freshman year already. Yeah, you know? yeah. And uh, so meanwhile, I was there, plans were already been made for me to play football, but I had never played football. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like football was just something I just picked up and was good at it. Yeah. Like, so your first time playing was your freshman year of high school? Well, I played when I was like sixth grade, but I just never knew the game like that. You know? Yeah, I mean? yeah, so, yeah. You know, just threw me in there. Like I was good. I played DN, like no responsibilities. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I was. So I learned, you know what I'm saying? So um, so when I came back, um, I had like so much hatred and so much. Of course. I, my next question was like, did, did they put you in therapy? Did you have to like do therapy or anything like yeah, that? Just I, I know you was like, I yeah. mean, you probably was all over the place at only 14. Like you yeah. had been through so much. Like, yeah, like I was just like I said, I just didn't care anymore at the time. I had just so much pent up frustration. And I'm like, damn, this man just put me through all this stuff, lied about it. And then the one person. And your mom, not even like she passed years before that. Yeah. And I didn't even know nothing about it. And so yeah. there was yeah. put me in therapy. But like therapy back there for me, it was like there was asking stupid questions like, oh, why are you angry? What do you think? Like, you know, what I'm right, saying? right, right, right. <laughs> like, I'm just like, so I just told him, I said, this ain't even working because they're not even really trying to figure out what why I am the way I am. Right. And so when she, you know, so I came back in October. So like that year, uh, like when I landed in United, back in Salt Lake, we had like the whole people like my church come out and, you know, bring pot of food and things like that to kind of celebrate me come, overcoming one of my biggest ordeals. And then um, I had a coach that started the football program my, my high school my freshman year he bought all the equipment all the stuff like that you know what i'm saying because he still want to start a tradition up there 
And so he came out and started talking to me. Like he talked to my adopted mom about me starting to play football for him, you know, because he was like building a program or whatnot. And so I remember landing and it took me about like a week to adjust to the jet lag and all that stuff like that. And I remember going back to my uh, private school, the LCA Lane Christian Academy, and the whole student body came out. So I was just giving me like, you know, like a whole uh, congratulatory celebration for making it for, uh, through this far, um, one of the biggest ordeals of my life. And so I started playing football and that's when I started like unleashing my anger because I played safety and linebacker. You know what I mean? That was the position I should have played. Although I did play receiver, but like that's what, my, yeah, yeah, yeah. Use that anger on the field. That's perfect. I used to take all the junk out, and I had a coach that was telling me, "Hey, like if you make it to NFL, I put a scar on this, you know, on his hand." He's like, "If you make it, I'm a tattoo, you know." Da da da. Like, yeah. All this. I'm like, okay, cool. So I did that. Um, so I went through that process, and then that Christmas we celebrated Christmas, and then 2004, the next year, not even a year later, May 19, 2004, my doctor found the lady to take me and passes away. Right. So of heart failure. So then it was like another big loss because I'm like, this is the next person I trusted, like next to my mom. Right. Right. Yeah, up to she passed away the next year. So like it got hit mm. home like that. You know, what I mean? I'm like, man, like what's going on? And so I remember. Going and to and in those moments, like, how are you dealing with with death, like death from these women that that mean so much to you? Like you just it, I'm, I mean, I'm sure you probably didn't really have any anything in your toolbox to pull from. So you just kind of like learning how to live with the pain. Yeah, I just had to absorb the pain, man. I just had to take yeah. one chin. It's like basically like you're in a corner in a boxing match. You're just taking haymakers left and right. Yeah, yeah. You know, trying to deflect, you know what I mean? Like you're just trying to duck off. Yeah. That's like everything just kept on hitting me. So I'm like trying to like, you know, trying to figure out where I can counter, trying to figure something out. Mm -hmm. And so I kept on getting hit left and right, you know what I mean? Just trying to adjust. So I didn't really have much to draw on, but like I depended on football and basketball, you know, because basketball was my other sport that I played that I did exceptionally well. We won state like that, but I just had to depend on sports and I had to take my aggression on in sports. And um, so that's kind of what helped me going on. And I remember like running sprints and stuff like that. I would like push myself to the edge where like, right. it, it physically like hurt. But, that's, like, your, was, that's your only outlet. That's the only outlet you got. Was. Yeah, I, I pushed myself in sports. You can ask anybody. Like I was always trying to finish first and everything, races, yeah. all that. Yeah. Running, like trying to push myself to the edge. Like I'm running. Shit, Shit I remember that from 2013 with the blizzard when you came on. <laughs> you, was, yeah. you, was still, you were still like that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. pushing. I'm like, no, like, you know what I'm saying? I'm just trying yeah. to push the pain, basically. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, dealt with that. And then, uh, so after everything happened, you know, like Christmas came about. So Christmas of 2004, my adoptive dad, you know, brought another lady in the home and kind of like asked me, my sister, my adoptive sister, like, what we want to do? And he said, he's about to get married in February of the next year, 2005. So I'm like, oh my God, here we go. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So his wife started being disrespectful, telling me I had to call her mom. And um, I remember when I went to Nigeria, I bought my mom like a daishiki outfit, you know what I mean? Just to bring my first souvenir when I was back there in Nigeria. And uh, she wore that junk to church and it just pissed me off. You know what I'm saying? So wow, like, yeah. No, you know what I'm saying? But as a kid, think about it. I'd already been through a lot. So exactly. I'm not gonna take a kid off, you know what I'm saying? Exactly. Off. It's kind of like she she was kind of triggering you, like like she yeah. or or she probably like it sounded like she may have identified your triggers and then like 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 wanted to ignite them, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And so that happened. So she they told us in Christmas of 2004 that they get married in February uh 2005, and they wanted us, me and my sister to be in the wedding, and I just couldn't do it, you know what I'm saying? At the time, I just all lost the respect for her as a person because I'm like you coming in the home, if you come in a new person, you got to come in quiet. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You got you to find your lane. We don't know you like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I dealt with that. And so, you know, went through that. They got married and I wasn't in the wedding because I just couldn't endure that. You know what I mean? Right, so, right. 2005. And then we just had a lot of problems. And I remember I didn't get my driver's license until I was 17 or no, 18. And I was you, you came out of high school 2007, right? Yeah, yep. So, so like... Man, yeah, it's a lot to unpack here. So, like, you going through all this, like, socially at home in the midst from, like, 2005 to 2007, when do you start noticing that, like, you super good in football to the point where it's, like, you could potentially, like, because I saw you went to junior college route, but yeah. but when did that light switch kind of hit on, like, you could potentially play, like, Division One college football while you're in the midst of, like, did, did you really not notice it because you got so much going on in your personal life or, like, I didn't, I didn't notice anything. Cause like basically the first sport I played was soccer when I was a jit. That's what I was good at. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. like 20 goals my senior. That's like my sport that I knew like growing up. I didn't know mm -hmm. nothing. I knew about basketball cause my mom played basketball, but I didn't know the rules or anything. I didn't know the rules about football or anything. That's just something I picked up because they pushed me to play. Yeah. And so by the time I was telling you like all the problems that happened with uh, my, my adopted dad and his wife. Um, so my junior, I ended up moving out. 
I moved to my school administrators, I'm saying that's when like my grades kind of left from like a 1.7 to like a 3.2. That's why I graduated with like 3.3 or something like that. Cumulative. Okay. But things started changing once I moved out at home because there's so much problems happening. And then people just started talking to me then like, hey man, like, I, I mean, I knew because I was like, I played running back, I played safety, but I knew like I was good. So like the couple of games that I went, I remember there was a game, I just talked to my coach, Coach Will, about this now. There was a game that I put a guy out, the, uh, the scouts at Weber State came to watch somebody play. And one of the, I, was like, I think it was Duchenne or whatever, like some school. And I remember I put one of the running backs out the game. You know what I mean? So I put him out the game, severed the shoulder and everything like that. Everybody's like, damn, who is this kid? That's when they started talking, like writing everything on the board. Like, oh man, this yeah. kid got attention to play. Cause you know what I'm saying? You knew how to tackle all the time. Yeah. So yeah. Will started staying in my ear. Like, oh man, like, bro, like you, you, you that guy, man, you that tailback. You are a tailback, bro. Like, you know what I'm yeah. saying? And remember I told you how we used to run, like we used to run the hills and I used to like just push myself and try to make sure everybody, you know, so did the same thing. And so I remember passing out running the hills. So that's when like I knew coach was like, man, like you're, you're that guy, you know what I'm saying? Like you're our tailback, you know? So I started doing that. But within that time span of five years, I went through five different coaches in, in four years for football. So that kind of made it hard to try and adjust a different system, different offenses, everything like that. So at that time, like my junior year and, the, and senior year, that's when I kind of started realizing, hey, like I'm good at this thing called football or sports in general. But I had nobody kind of walk me throughout the process. Yeah, like, yeah. No, no, no guidance, like as far yeah. as like like qualifying to go to college, ACT, yeah. SAT, all that kind of stuff, clearing house, just all those things you got to do. Yeah. Yeah. All that junk. So now everything's gonna come effect now because like all that junk. So I went through all the, I'm still going through all this stuff. So my senior year was when everything kind of started happening. Like, okay, you gotta apply for clearing house, gotta do but then, like most people already know all that they tell the right, 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 right. In a year, like I'm scrambling trying to figure out what I'm gonna do with my life. Like, you know what I mean? So um, we had to apply for clearing house, take the SAT, all that junk like that or whatever, trying to figure out where I'm going to go. So mm -hmm. right before graduation, it was like, oh, what you going to do with your life? And then that's when uh, I signed with Weber State, you know what I'm saying, the time coming out of high school mm -hmm. when Osman McBride was up there. And uh, so I ended up going up there to start figuring out classes. But they, because uh, I'm being in Utah at the time, they wanted me just to, to stay uh, off campus. And they was going to try to give me, you know, uh, pay my, for my room and board afterwards. So I was like, well, okay. I really afford to do that because I don't really have a home. You know, I'm staying right. with other people, not right. my life actually blood family or whatever because most people everybody's like, oh, i'm going home to grandma house or whatever i had none of that you know right right so, um so me and coach will we kind of figured it out I was like, okay well we can go to snow college and figure it out so i ended up going to snow college mm -hmm. uh, it was doing like the little walk on uh walk on trials and stuff obviously i didn't walk uh, but they just brought me brought me to watch everybody else and just have a conversation with the coaches up there and they just love everything i did you know the energy mm -hmm. I'm and so I got a cause a full scholarship up there, and that's how that kind of started. You know, what I mean, that's when I kind of started new and everything. So the true freshman, I played say uh, uh, safety and uh, DB. So I was playing DB. Um, I played a good deal or whatever. I made a couple of plays. I ran down. Played DB at Snow College. Yeah, Snow College. Okay. Okay. Snow, Snow College. And so for me, like once I graduated high school, it was like the biggest thing transition for me because like I had no blueprint. Nobody exactly. Exactly. Like before. I had no grandpa, no aunt, no uncle. Exactly. Like, and, and and that's one thing that I like to highlight on here. And like and I ask everyone to explain that transition from high school. Yes. And you have been through so much yes. into college when you kind of like you essentially on your own and you have to figure things out. You have to have time management. You got to go to class. You got to go. You got to lift weights. You got to, you know, you got practice, all these kind of study table, training table, all these kind of things. So, so your transition was tough. Yeah. So my transition was tough because it was like, once I left high school, it was like, I felt like the, the, my school administrators and people that kind of, just in my family, I still could talk to them now, you know what I'm saying? But it's like, once I left, their residence my senior year is like you're on your own figure it out you know what i mean like i never had a place to kind of like go back and say oh, i'm coming home for thanksgiving or christmas or you know what i mean or grandma, right. or grandma. i never had that because my blood family was in nigeria and i you know everybody else was basically strangers to me that became family around here you know so, exactly so when i went to juco my freshman year like it was like the, the hardest transition because all i had was the money from senior night i had a chevy corsica that i packed with all my belongings i ended up going to juco and I luckily had a buddy that played at one of the high schools with me that, you know, I was competing with since I was a jit. And so we kind of, kind of helped me out whatever. We stayed in the apartment and mm -hmm. get a ghetto E from whatnot. And so I kind of dealt with all that. And so I had to like, just kind of challenge myself and tell myself, like, I, I couldn't, who, who's I going to run to? I couldn't run to nobody. I just had to face my problems by myself and challenge it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like, just kind of try to like figure it out. And so I just had to remember back when my mom, when I was a jit, my mom used to tell me, Hey, like, do everything you whenever whenever you do something, do it one hundred percent. Never mm -hmm. give up all that stuff. Like that always stuck with me. So like I mean, like, everything I used to do, I, you know, what I mean, was just one hundred percent. Like do it the yeah. best. I could. But I right. didn't have the guidance. I didn't nobody taught me. I just was trying to figure it out on my own. You know, what I mean, right, so, right. 
shoes right now. You're going to tie however you know how you tie your shoes instead of the, the appropriate right. way to tie it, you know? So, like all, the, all those years, um, did you ever have like any breakdowns? Like once you got like 18, 19, 20, just because there were so many things that you didn't know, but I mean, you were blessed in a sense where you kept, just, you kept figuring it out. You didn't have, you didn't have any resources. You didn't have nobody to call, but you just, you kept figuring it out. You, like you said, you kept giving hundred percent. You just kept I, figuring it out. I was just going through the motion. And that my thing that I, that helped me out was like, I just looked at everything like sarcastic. I don't know if you noticed when we first played, like I was always quiet. You know what I'm saying? That yeah. was my way of, of, processing everything in my head and trying to work through everything like that. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, when I came, like, I was always quiet, like, just didn't say much. Just, right. You know what I'm saying? With the whoop and one like that. Okay, cool. You know, so I dealt with that. So that was just kind of what helped me out. So I, I, I didn't have any breakdowns because I didn't look at life that way. I didn't feel sorry for myself. I didn't say, uh, oh, yeah, right. And I said, no, like, it happened. Okay, what am I going to do from this instance? Right. To from this right. Although right. it was in the back of my mind, but it was like, okay, if I sit there and dwell in that, is that right. going to me in the future right. or people that's a like, great way to think man yeah I, I, at that time like i was 18 years old i was like i had to figure it out because i had people in nigeria struggling you know what i'm saying so i was mm -hmm. like nobody who's going to depend on i'm the first one right. to go to college for my family and the first one to get a high school diploma at the time or whatever you know what i'm saying so i went through that process um dealt with that and i was able to just channel everything so yeah my sophomore so year comes about and it was like the hardest transition too because um that was talking about everything. I'm looking like, man, I kind of want to play receiver because I want to play running back. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Because so sophomore year, that's when you started hearing from D1 schools. Yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah. So we kind of switched around. But I ended up registering my sophomore year because they switched me to offense to play receiver because they needed more size and speed. And okay. so I did everything. I had great hands. I did all that stuff like that. I came out standing player for them. You know, the, the coaches did a great job. Coach Coburn, Coach Hughes, um, all Coach Mayfu, Coach King, all of them. Like, they did a great job just kind of like helping us out. You know what I'm saying? Do what yeah. they had to do. Yes, yeah. so we played for the national championship my freshman year. I mean, yeah, okay. my year, we played against uh, uh, was it Butler, and then we ended up losing by a field goal. We blocked the field goal, and then they recovered it. One of our play players touched it, they recovered in the end zone to win the game. Okay, so for the national championship, Juco. But so my sophomore year, I switched to receiver and I redshirted and I played receiver. So one year receiver, I got you know, I talked to a bunch of schools. Um, I was talking like University of Utah, I was talking to Utah State, they was all interested, but some of them just wanted me to wait. And so I remember, I remember taking my uh, my my visit to University of Wyoming with my buddy that I played with. I played X, he played Y. Okay. Me and C, my bad. So we kind of like, you know, like one of the one-two gang of, you know, uh, snow cards or whatever receiver. Mm -hmm. And so we took our recruiting visit and that's when kind of like, you know, they brought the, the coaches and stuff up there, Wyoming. And so that's kind of happened. But for me, like the whole transition from JUCO to D1 was just completely different because oh, man. I had been through already. Like, yeah. Like, who am I going to depend on? You know what I mean? I had nobody out there and I remember going through all the process, but I just couldn't focus because it was like everything that was happening. I had nobody to kind of like lean on and depend on, Hey, like I need guidance right. what I need to do. Cause nobody really walked me through the process of going to college, mm -hmm. or what to do to make it to the league or, you know what I'm saying? You need an agent, none of that stuff. So everything I was doing, I was figuring out on my own. Like, you yeah. know what I mean? Get from another country, didn't speak English. I'm still figuring out, but I made it this far. I can't stop now. You know what I mean? I had to keep going. Right. Right. Yeah. So I went through that and I mean, I did a little bit of what I had to do, but I felt like I didn't do what I had to do because, you know, my mind was just not focused on being there and do what I had to do. You so know? you spent, you did, you spent two years at Wyoming. Yep, I spent two years at Wyoming. So two okay. years in snow and then two years at Wyoming. I got in Wyoming in January of 2010 and then went through spring ball. I was like, you know what I'm saying? So trying mm -hmm. to figure everything out. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that was like the toughest thing. And then like, um, yeah, just, them, them going from a uh, junior college spring, spring ball and practices and training camps to division yeah. one. Yeah. It's, it's, it, I mean, obviously you got bigger facilities, you got, you got more access and resources and stuff like that, but it's just the, the game is more intense. The yeah. competition is better. You know what I'm saying? Cause everybody's pretty good. Yeah. And so like, I was trying to understand that better cause I had never been in that environment before, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I was trying to process, but I just never really had, that uncle or that grandpa or that that somebody back here like hey like you doing a good job or da 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 because I never had that my whole life you know what I'm saying right 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 and so went to Wyoming did what I had to do did you have any moments that that stood out uh, during your time in Wyoming um, I mean I just had a few catches when we went to like Texas and stuff like that we played up there uh, okay so like that was a couple of things but I just felt like for me like I just didn't 
I couldn't focus. That was my biggest thing. I just felt like I couldn't focus on everything, you know, like that was the toughest thing. Yeah, like, like you felt like everything going on in your personal life was kind of like like weighing on you. Yeah, yeah I mean, you was just trying to like walk around with it, carry it. Yeah, trying to carry it and while trying to figure out things that were coming ahead. Yeah, yeah. While I was trying to, you trying to graduate from college. <laughs> yeah, if I was just piling everything on top, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so I remember yeah. like graduating college too. Like the, the worst thing about me was like when I graduated, like I literally walked the stage by myself. I had nobody in the stands, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I remember seeing out at, at JUCO, even at Snow College, even in Wyoming, when I walk across the line, my boy that I played with, he played line. His mom had to walk out with me on senior out of JUCO. Mm -hmm. And then when I went to Wyoming, like they're calling all the seniors out with the rows and whatnot. Like I'm walking mm -hmm. out by myself, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And one of my buddy's mom saw me walking out by myself. I was like, oh, snap, then ran out there with me just so I could have somebody, you know what I mean? But so for me, like that kind of like shocked my mind. Like, damn, like, why can't mm -hmm. I have what everybody else has? You know, people- Yeah, I was about to say, did you, seeing those people, cause I'm actually, it's funny you say that, my jersey behind me, that's me, my 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 mom and my father, um, um, at Senior Night. And that hearing your story, man, definitely uh makes me a lot like a lot more appreciative of you know having both of my parents. But like, did that ever make you like seeing all these guys have their parents, like did that ever make you like just upset or like just you kind of like fall into a second place for a little bit, just like wondering why your life is the way it ended up being. Yeah, I've always thought about that since I got the JUCO. I was like, why has my life got to be like this? You know what I'm saying? Like, I always, right. like, against myself, like, <clears throat> why everybody else has their mom and dad showing up to college, bringing care packages, bringing this. But me, I had, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, I had the people I can call back, you know, the stuff like that. But it wasn't the same. It's like, I had, I'm looking at people like, you know, like, I had one of my boys named Joe. <clears throat> His mom used to come up there. She throw down, you know what I'm saying? She throw down in the kitchen, cook food, and they about laughing and gigging. But I'm like, dang, like, why can't I have that? You know what I mean? So I always thought that in my head, like, why is my life got to be like this? Why do I have to do things like this and go through things alone? You know what I mean? But I'm not a person to go, like, begging somebody to, to be there for me. You know what I mean? Right, I'm right. Regardless, you know what I'm saying? Right. So you always stuck in the back of my head, like, why is my life like this? Why did things go on like this accordingly? But I mm -hmm. decided to go and take it in the pain. Like, like I told you, like, the boxing match is taking it. Just boom, boom, boom. Just take yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Learn, learn to live with that pain, man. I know it. Man, so, I, I know if it is at some point, it seems like any and everyone will have a breaking point. You know what I mean? Just yeah. just carrying all that load, you know? Yeah. So it was it was kind of tough. So when I finished the college, I mean, I, I did the pro day Wyoming and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, 2012 draft. Um, I think we were in the same draft. We both went undrafted. So like so after your pro day, did you have an agent? Did you already know, like maybe you can look at the CFL if you didn't get anything from NFL arena, any of that? I didn't know anything about the CFL. I didn't know nothing about the agent. I didn't know nothing. All I did was like, we were having a pro day. Okay, cool. Go out there and run. Okay, go right. ahead. And do this. Okay, cool. Like, you know what I'm saying? That's all I did, but I didn't know the process of anything. That's why I said not having somebody there or like to talk to me all my life was like the hardest thing for me. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? It's like most people, oh yeah, I got, you know, my buddy coming in. Da -da. You know, like they talked and walking through the process. I just didn't know the process. You know what I mean? So I finished everything. I didn't hear back. Um, so I was just like, well, what am I going to do now? You know what I'm saying? So when I graduated college, he was like, what do you do now? You know what I'm saying? Like, I All never right. had a blueprint. That's what we was talking about. I never had a blueprint. What do you do outside, outside of college? Like most Exactly. And that, but a lot of people that my buddy was like, oh, well, I'm going back to my mom's house. I'm going to stay till I save up to start a business or whatever. Right, right, I right. Didn't do none of that. You know Right, right. You didn't, yeah, you didn't have those resources. Yeah, right. I didn't have that. So the thought in my head was like, okay, you got to figure out what you're going to do. I mean, I still- That transition from college- to the, the like yeah, the real, the real so world, cool. like that's the biggest, that's where this, I, that's where this idea, that's where this show came from, the after effect. Like when you have to like go from, damn, I, you already got to deal with the fact that you didn't get drafted or you may have to be done playing football, yep. but then having to figure that out. Luckily, like you said, I had some resources. Like I went back and stayed with my dad for a little bit, then my mom, before I went out to Green Bay to play. And that's where we met. Yeah. But I can only imagine what you had to go through because you didn't have no resources. Just watch Green Bay is about to come up here pretty soon. So like how everything's kind of transpired, you know, so just got a little watered down. So um, so when I finished in 12, like I'm still trying to figure out what I got to do. Um, and so like, I'm like, man, like, what am I going to do? I, I still felt like I still had like, you know, the knack ability. I'll do like, of course, football. we still young, 22, 23. Yeah. yeah but I was like, elder football wasn't my first sport, but I was like, well, it's something I'm going to try to do to make the league or whatever. So I can make some money, take care of my people back home in Nigeria and do this mm -hmm. and that. Like, mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So. I'm trying to figure it out. And I remember talking to, I don't know if you know Tashawn Gibson. He's all pro bowl safety in the NFL right now, whatever. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That name sounds familiar. 
Yeah, he went to one University of Wyoming. Me and him, Chris, Chris Brzezinski. There's a bunch of people like uh, that, uh, Mike Brzez, uh, Purcell, all the people that are still in the league right now. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but Tashar Gibson, he played in Wyoming. Him and his brother were the corners that played on that, along each other, each, other, each other, whatever. So we had talked in the locker room a couple of times. And so he knew a guy named Scott Porter. You know Scott. Yeah, I know Scott. Yeah. Yep. So that's how I got introduced to Scott the first time. So Okay, okay. So I left. Um, I left the University of Wyoming when I graduated. I went back to Salt Lake City, Utah, and I started working with Delinqu I mean, with Trouble Youth. And uh, so I was, you know, making a little bit of money. It wasn't making a lot or whatever. Like, that was the hardest transition because I'm like, I need money now. You know, I got to Right. Find so, I mean, yeah, you move back <laughs> home and all you, you, you put in apps. You're trying to find a job. Yeah. yeah I'm trying to figure it out. So yeah. I started working. And then, uh, so I heard, that's when I started hearing about arena football. You know what I'm saying? There was a mm -hmm. team called the Utah Blaze. It was a AFL1 at the time. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they played at the Energy Solutions Arena, which was the Delta Center. And then I forgot what they call it now, the Vivant Center or something like that, whatever. But so they played up there. And so, like, you know, I went out there, watched a couple of times. I was like, okay, like maybe I, you know, I could see myself playing this junk, you know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. And uh, so I remember, you know, talking to all the coaches. I signed a contract to go up to the camp with them, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. so I went to camp and I got released right after camp. So to me, I'm like, dang, I'm a disappointment. I'm never going to make it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Da, 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 da. Right. So I started lingering in my head. And uh, so I'm trying to figure it out. So I talked to Deshaun. He's like, yeah, I got this guy named Scott. Da, da, da. Hit him up. Boo, boo. So I hit him up. Okay, cool. So Scott's like, well, what you trying to do? You know what I mean? I was like, well, I'm still trying to, I'm just looking for opportunity. You know what I'm saying? And so I remember I flew back. Uh, uh, I mean, I, before I went to Green Bay, I talked to Scott. And then um, so that's what Scott hit me up. Like, oh, you know, Coach Baldwin, da, da, da. You know what I'm saying? I want you to come out here. Because I had talked to Coach Baldwin on the phone before. Mm -hmm. kind of same story with him basically so he's like oh okay da, da, da. and so to him he was like talking to me about you know like just everything i told him is like about being appreciative of the little things we talked about right right you know? well he called me on the phone we talked chopped it up for hours and stuff like that and uh so scott was like yeah like you know if you want to you can get you a contract to go to green bay you know mm -hmm. what I, mean? I was like, okay so i took all the money i had from the job i was working a little bit pay for a flight to green bay and i remember i landed in green bay you know remember dirty right so, of course. <laughs> yeah, so we get up there, like I landed there, but I landed late at nighttime. And so Dirty was in the apartment, him and Scoop. And uh, so, you know, I'm, I made a little bed in the living room. So and I had my, my little suitcase. That's all I had with me. Like, that's all yeah. I had when I left college, my suitcase and my little duffel bag. Yeah. Uh, went up there, stayed in the living room, and I started talking about I remember I got up late at nighttime, and uh, Dirty was sitting there making a bologna sandwich or whatever. And he, like, I, I didn't say nothing. I just sat there quietly. I was just by myself, cool, like, just calm, collected. I'm just trying to figure everything out, process everything in my head. Yeah. He said, bro, you hungry, dog? And I remember, like, you could ask him to this day. You tell you that. He said, you hungry, dog? I'm like, yeah, bro. You know what I'm saying? Because nobody talking about going out, getting food. Like, I don't know. Yeah. That, nothing. So, like, yeah. Okay. Give me another a sandwich. You share the sandwich. So our bond just started clicking like that, bro. I was like, bro, I got you, bro. I'm like, dang, okay, cool. So then, like, you know what I'm saying? Well, next day, like, you know, we got sat down in the little circles. I always like share you a little story, but it was kind of hard for me to share my story. But I was like, that's, that's now you know, like, everything, you know, it makes right. sense. Right. Sure. Right. So I share, you know, like the things I kind of went through a little bit, but it was like kind of hard for me to kind of open up about it. But I was like, whatever. Yeah. I, I feel like, like, by the end of the season, you had definitely opened up. And I remember, when we had like that, like team barbecue at the like yeah, at the yeah. end before everybody was about to leave, like that, like that was like a great time, man. We was everybody was bonding, everybody we was all like brothers. Yeah, so that's when I caught the back end of that jerk, and so then I was like, okay, well, I started building a report with everybody else, a relationship with everybody else, but then guess mm -hmm. what? Got to throw the do sign. Got you know what I'm saying? But, uh, yeah, and with the blizzard. Yeah. Oh, I remember that. You don't remember that? Uh uh. So you didn't finish. You didn't finish. That so year with the visit? Season, that's what I'm saying. That to after the season, then I oh, left. Okay. Salt Lake and start working with the kids again. And then okay. I started doing the Utah Blaze thing or whatever. And then when that happened, I got released. And then so I remember. And you played for like um what like five or six, like five seasons for yeah. a bunch of different teams, right? Yep. So did that, and then so I remember flying to Iowa. So the reason why I got back to Iowa was like I remember flying to Iowa. Um, I flew to Iowa. I had 200 bucks in my pocket. That's all I had, and I had my suitcase and my duffel bag. And uh, I remember I came out here for a workout. You know, Coach Ho called me. He's like, hey, like, you know, do you, like, come out here? Like, da, da, da. I'm like, okay, cool. So I came for a workout. And uh, so I remember I'm doing what I had to do. I felt like I did what I had to do, but they couldn't sign me because there was a receiver deep up here. And so I got released. So I went back. And then so that's when Utah picked me up in the back end of the season. There was like four games left in the season, five games left in the season. And I finally got my contract. You know, they called me. They come in for a two-day workout. I'm like, okay, cool. So I went in there. And I did what I had to do when another two-day work I did finally sign me for a contract or whatever. And so I remember signing like on a Wednesday. And that's the reason why that jersey, number 29, I don't know if uh -huh. you see that. 
Yeah. Oh yeah, I can see it. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember when you signed with them. Yeah, you was doing your thing. Yep. So I signed with them, and I remember like it was the craziest thing because the first play I never played arena ball before, and I remember he called it a concept of bacon or whatever, and I remember running the corner route. And I caught the touchdown, my back just hit the wall, and I just got up just energized, just like, oh my God, like this feels so good. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Like yeah. I just got excited. So that happened. And so, you know, that was like the first time I felt like I had accomplished something. I was like, dang, I finally got mm-hmm. on the pace where I could stay for a little bit. Mm-hmm. That went on. Then at the end of the season, that team sees operations. So all the players were on the country. I got this purse all over the place. But here I was as somebody rookie that right. you know, experience the league i gotta start back from square one again you know what i mean so right right a lot of stuff you know been, been all these teams went to different places and stuff so it came yeah. out like season and it was just i played one game in bemidji uh minnesota for the axemen and i remember mm-hmm. like i just stole the show you know what i mean did everything i had to do and that's how i came out to iowa and played the whole season up here and that's the first time i felt like i was just part of something you know what i mean the whole season so mm-hmm. all that stuff happening and it was just that's how the, the transition kind of started happening in football. And then, like, you know, after that, it was like. Yeah, after, like, um, so 2017 was the last year that you played. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, yeah, like, like kind of talk about that because that that's the part that, that I always love to bring up. Like, kind of like that day or that time when you knew, like, okay, like, I'm probably done playing. Like, I'm not I'm probably not going to strap it up again. Um, um, you know, I got to figure something else out. Now it now on outside looking in, it looked like you figured that out because you transitioned from football player to author. Like you automatically, you know, got into it and started and start writing a book. Yeah. So like, how was that time for you? Like, was it was it a hard time? Did you was it an easy transition? Like, okay, no, like I've been through all this, so I'm gonna just go from football to author and I'm gonna just do this. Like, how was that transition for you? So the transition was kind of crazy. So when I went through my whole ordeal when I got kidnapped and the whole school came out. Um, some of my teachers back in high school tell me, hey, like, you need to write a book. You know what I'm saying? But it was just mm-hmm. in the back of my mind, so I never thought it. I was just like, as a kid, I'm going through everything. I'm dealing with everything, so I never thought about it that way. And so, like, when everything kind of fast forward to college, did all this stuff like that, my whole big thing was make it to the NFL, make life a little bit easier, whatnot. You know what I'm mm-hmm. going to take, take, take care of. And uh, so 2017 came about. I was like, once I played, like, I was just like, man, like, I got to figure something out. Like, you know what I mean? Like, because at the time I was in financial estate, but I didn't have mom, dad, grandma. Everywhere I went, I had to make, I had to find food, I had to find shelter, I had to figure out things. Like, I didn't have mom a call, hey, I need about $1,000 or 500 You know what I'm saying? I right. didn't that. Right. So I had to work, you know what I'm saying? So um, when I was with the Utah team, um, we was about to go play the uh, Pittsburgh team. Uh, so we about to play Pittsburgh and we was in the airport in the food court and some guy, some random guy, this, I'll tell you like guys working, like it, it was crazy how this junk happened. And so we was in a food court, you know, we get our little per diem, like stipend or whatever, spend on food and stuff like that or whatever. So we're in the food court, everybody buying the food or whatever. And I'm sitting there, you know me, and once I get comfortable, I'm laughing, I'm talking to people, busting jokes or whatever. And some random guy walks up to me, he's like, hey man, can I talk to you real quick? I'm like, who are you? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, why are you approaching me? Like, I don't know you like that. Oh, you guys are sports team? I'm like, yeah, we're about to go play Pittsburgh. And uh, so he's like, oh, okay. He's like, well, can I do an interview, a podcast interview with you about self-doubt? His name was Jared. And uh, so I'm like, podcast like what are you talking about you know what i'm saying <laughs> like, explaining to me i'm like oh okay so that's fine i guess so did an interview about self-doubt and i, I killed the interview you know what i mean he's like, oh dang i love it start sharing some of the experiences i went through he's like man like you got a story to share i was like well i'm trying to write a book you know what i mean eventually like I, that's when the idea kind of popped up the first time mm-hmm. he's like well, i got this chick she's the editor um have you been doing anything but because all those years i started writing some stuff but i just never got in depth about it right. so i came to iowa like I couldn't sleep at night time. I had sleeping problems. I'll go to bed about like three or four o'clock in the morning, wake up at six, go to work, work the double 16 hours, come back home, do the same thing. I average 120 hours every two weeks at work. Mm. And, um, so I was just right, right, right. And then eventually I just told myself, I'm just locked myself in this room and just get the book done. So I just finished it out, wrote a bunch of stuff and I sent it to Chick and I was like, hey, like, here's what I got written. She looked at it. She was like, wow, this is amazing. Like you're writing. It's just crazy. I don't have to really change anything. Just a few grammatical, uh, grammatical things. So I'm like, what? Like you really serious? She's like, yeah. Cause I, me, I never thought I'd be able to write something like that. If coming from where I come from the child. Right. Thing. So I'm like, what? Right. So we put everything together. She did the edit of the whole manuscript of what she had to do. Like, you know, fix a couple of things, whatever. And then the rest was history. I figured out how to do my cover. I self-published my book on Amazon. Mm-hmm. I did a myself so that's how that came about you know what i mean so i kind of transitioned to that because i was like man like for me it was like everything i went through i basically like it was therapeutic for me to get everything out of my head you know absolutely yeah that definitely a form of therapy and then like also the fact that you still here 
and like a lot of a law abiding citizen and and sane. Like yeah. at this point, at this point, you got to pay it for it. You got to tell your story and hope that it inspired the next person that 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 goes through like similar things. And that's kind of why I did that. So like I wrote everything down. I, I wrote all my experiences that I went through with that. I wrote my experience about the car accident that I had that I died in in 08 when I was a JUCO. I wrote about so many things, you know what I'm saying, that I had went through and endured. So like my mm-hmm. whole thought process was it was because like we're all connected. We all learn throughout each other's experiences, you know what I mean? So for me to kind of get everything out, it helped me get everything out of my head because I told you I remember everything. I remember dates. I remember times. You can say this day, like back then, like I just, I could spit, you know what I'm saying? Like Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to remember it, yeah. Yeah, so I spat everything out on that sheet of paper. It was like so relieving to just get everything out of my head because it was like so much pressure in my head. Mm-hmm. So I got it out and so we got that done. So I was like, man, let me just write this book to share my experience with people. So that kind of started bringing more speaking gigs. I go speak in elementary schools, you know, talk to people about my experience or whatnot. So that kind yeah, of trend. That's what it's about. I have to do, you know what I mean? So the transition was kind of hard because I was like, man, like had I just had one person just be there just to kind yeah. of Gonna kind of like give me the blueprint of everything. Yeah, yeah. One form of like a resource. Yeah, which I mean, like I said, hindsight is always twenty twenty. You know, like it would it, even if I were to have one person, who knows if I were to make it or not. You know what I mean? Exactly. But like, exactly. Like, if I were just have one person, it might have made a difference. It might not. Who knows? Yeah, but, yeah. But, I mean, your mind naturally is always gonna wonder like that and think like maybe okay. this would happen or whatever. But the way I look at it is like I said. <laughs> Man, there's always has a plan. Yeah, I mean everything always. is always supposed to. Although we, if we're not, we might not get what we want, but we always impact everybody else. Because the way I look at it now, my book has impacted so many people. You know, what mm-hmm. I, mean? mm-hmm. I remember I have a teacher now. She's teaching my book to kids, and kids literally would come up to me like, "Man, I got anxiety, or I got this, or like, you know, I'm blessed with this, this." But like reading your book, maybe just appreciate just yeah. having good things in life. So I'm like, well, that's a lesson a lot of people in America and society nowadays need to learn. Is like. Dusty, everybody's man. Spoiled, everybody's greedy everybody's this but then it's like tomorrow everything could just be like this gone within the time frame but y'all not appreciating that you know so that's why you look at everything i'm like yeah okay so for me to transition to that just kind of helped me just kind of flip everything out like i'm not where i want to be right now yet still but it's like you know it's still like a step in the ladder where i need to be so yeah that transition kind of helped me just kind of get up but like i mean i've always had thoughts like maybe i'd play one more year because i feel like i didn't really do what i had to do because okay uh, football wise or whatever it was always like never like a full season the place i played the full season was iowa you okay know I mean? everywhere like you mean like when we were to green bay i played like the back end of the season um utah back end of the season um the first time in iowa like the back end of the season then i played the full season um like washington i played the back end of the season but it was like never like oh go plays starting camp and go through the whole process you know oh, dang. yeah yeah like in the middle of the season because i was always trying to figure out life but yeah that transition was for me so i always thought about like maybe just strap it up one more time maybe not maybe just keep doing what i'm doing you know what i mean like but yeah, it's like, yeah. Like, see know? i knew i knew for me at last i played for the iowa bar summer 2016 yeah. and at the time i was like 27 so i knew like that was my last time yeah. whatever happened happened I, I didn't even play the whole season i played like 10 games um and then i went back to atlanta and just kind of went back to work um yeah. uh yeah man but like that thinking about that last time like knowing that's gonna be your last time putting that helmet on and all that man it's definitely it took me a while it was a transition it took me about six months to like kind of i was i had like an identity crisis right i didn't i started playing football when i was eight so like football basketball from eight to 18 then just football the rest of the way man so i kind of lost myself and forgot who i was outside of football what i like to do outside of sports so i had to like um um identify that and then like kind of like reinvent myself um to to who I am now, man. So yeah, I love highlighting that transition, man. Cause it's never, now some guys, I know some guys and I'm sure you do too, who make the transition easy. They know they want to coach. They oh, just yeah. dive straight into coaching or they yeah. dive straight into like entrepreneurship, whatever the case may be. But for the most part, most guys it, it kind of struggle a little bit. Yeah. So, I mean, like just to add to what you were saying earlier, it was like, for me, it's like the, the trying to figure out everything is like as a kid, everything I was going through, like my biggest thing I felt like I never had was like, I never had time to think about what I want to do, what I want to be, you know, because when I came here, like, it was like, Oh, okay. Sports. Okay. Throw yourself. They threw me in the fire, basically. You know what I'm saying? Figure mm-hmm. it out. I never like had an idea with, like, okay, I want to be a firefighter. I never talked about it. I don't want to be this. I want to do this. I want to coach. You know what I mean? It was like, right. talk a little bit about those things, but like, I never had that blueprint. I understand like those conversations when people would keep talking to me, you know what I mean? Like, Hey, I want to do this. I want to do this outside of football. Right. But I 
attach myself to sports is like, oh, I'm gonna make it professionally. But a lot of people don't realize that you have to think outside the box. Is like, what if that something happens tomorrow or like you can't go on? Right, right. And you have to stop playing or whatever. Yeah. I never thought about that before. You know what I'm saying? So when that transition came about, when I, I had to figure everything out, I was like, man, like, I don't want to walk away right now when I was about like 25, 26. I don't really want to walk away right now. But the facts is like, I got to figure out a way to be, get financially stable. I got to find out where to get a crib by myself. I got to find out all these things like that or whatever. You know what I'm saying? So that mm-hmm. process, I'm like, dang, like I had to think about those things here or not because it hit me in the face basically. You know what I mean? So I was able to come back and kind of hit, get one haymaker. You know what I mean? Like, you know, kind of got my own place now. I got my own car. I got things going on. I mean, things are not perfect yet, but it's like, I was able to do those things and kind of make that transition a little bit better. You know what I mean? Because yeah. Well, and feel like I would not let myself give up basically. Yeah. Yeah, man. That's like you said, that's so inspiring. I was reading the, the reviews for your book on Amazon that, and that's what people were alluding to just how inspirational, you know, your story is, man. So like, it's only right that you continue to, you know, inspire the world really. Yeah. So and that's yeah. why I feel like we all got to, and my biggest thing is like, I love is like being able to talk to other people about their experiences and their stories mm-hmm. and because a lot of people don't know like you can learn a lot by about how people are or like what they go through by or by their story you know what i mean because you you can learn like by like, like you tell me your story i'd be like okay cool this worked for you i might try it and if you work for me okay cool if you don't all right cool and that give me a like, different blueprint to work on something you know what i mean but people don't understand that it's like oh just because this person grew up in a different environment mm-hmm. means that you know what i mean like i'm not gonna respect them whatever but it's like the whole world right now needs to stop and think okay cool I'm from whatever town I'm from, but this is the way I've learned things. But other people don't didn't learn this things this way. They learn in a different way. You know what I mean? Even when everything was going on in the world, it's like everybody was just like, no, it's my way, the highway. But it's like, you got to open your mind. Because for me, right. like, I've, like, I've been all over the place. You know, mm-hmm. I've been in Nigeria, Texas, Utah, Cal- like, Atlanta, like all the stuff like that. So I understood like the group dynamics of everything, how things work from different people. Right. But a lot of people don't see it that way. It's like they see things in just one sense. Like, oh, I'm, for instance, they say I'm from Iowa. I only was, eight, I never left here. But it's like, okay, you only know things that are closed off in one state. There's 49 other states, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh, and I and I know about that. You know, I went to school out there. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So people, like just so closed minded, but it's like you got to open your mind to different things and different ideas. Like, man, like exactly. okay, somebody had it harder or somebody, you know I mean? and I know like my story is like being hard or whatever, but it's like I know those people that had it worse too. And even to this day, like I know people that are dying and back home in Nigeria that you know, I'm like, dang, like you know what I mean? Like they're exactly. going way worse than me, but it's like Absolutely. people like, you know, but it's the crazy yeah. thing. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. I love that, bro. Um, so yeah, last question. What would you say is DJ Lester's after effect of just his entire journey? Like, what were some lessons that you learned, um, you know, when you started playing football uh, when you were 14 that you kind of took and you carry with you now, you know, pretty, pretty much as we try to, like, push the culture forward? Um, pushing the culture forward, I just feel like we we paved the, the way for the youth. You know what I'm saying? Like, even mm-hmm. when we were talking about earlier, like, before we get on football, it's like we talked about how, when we didn't have the internet, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like nowadays kids live on the internet. We had to hop on the internet to stay on the internet. Kids basically live on the internet now, you know, you mm-hmm. connect 24-7. Mm-hmm. So we paved the path for them by the, the, the generation, how we came about. So now going into sports is like, we paved the way for all these kids to get paid and for the likeness and college, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, we, man, it's a total different lifestyle now. <laughs> it's a whole different lifestyle. We came up with NCAA, like football, you know, 14 all the time when we got paid, like, you know what I mean? They're using the names all the time now we got paid for, but it's like, we paved the path for these kids. So moving forward is like, these kids have to like change. I mean, I appreciate what we did. Cause like, for me, like the transition was like, we did what we had to do. We bought, we did all the stuff like that. We sacrificed everything for them to have an easy life, easier life now, you know? Cause you look at mm-hmm. now, the facilities, they getting paid for their mm-hmm. name. You know what I'm saying? They getting all this stuff. We never got that. You know what exactly. I mean? So we were, Man, they, they negotiate, <laughs> they, they negotiating deals. That's as juniors saying. and seniors in high school. That's what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, damn, and they 10 years too late. <laughs> yeah so for us it's like man why can we get have that but it's like it makes you appreciate it because we did what we had to do to kind of get back to the first future generation you know exactly saying? exactly That's if we cool. didn't go through what we went through during our years they wouldn't be where they are now you know exactly. you know what i'm yeah. saying uh, so that's just how it is so like i said for me it's like that's just one thing i'm like look i appreciate it because like, we did what we had to do to kind of get back to the generation so now they what they're going to do to get back to the next generation under them All right you know what I'm exactly and that's how life the cycle of life happens. It's like we better everything. You look at throughout the generation before when our parents was kids, what they do, they went through way worse, more things than we did. Exactly, exactly. So we, as long as every generation gets better, like that's yeah. that's pretty much that's what it's about. That's that's how you know we're doing our due diligence, we're doing our part. 
Yep. So what I learned was just like I said, just progression. I learned a lot of discipline. Mm -hmm. I learned how to unity. I learned, you know what I'm saying, hard work, dedication, you know what I'm saying? All those those things that we were taught in the football. Mm -hmm. you know, like, even like when you didn't want to do something, coaches would still push you out your comfort zone to do it. Mm -hmm. like, Oh, and never give up like all those things that's what i learned so like that's kind of what like i was trying to get back to the generation now is like never give up you know what i mean and even with my book like that's what i talk to kids about is like never give up some days are worse than others but then as long as you keep putting one foot in front of the other things are oh man i'm good. telling yeah. you that's yes awesome. absolutely and so i know my life going is going to be like a boxing match you know what i mean you're going to keep taking them haymakers taking yeah them. it's never going to stop you either my father always say you either you you're either coming out of something or about to go through something else. Like yeah. it's never, life is never just all good. You always gonna have something going on. Yeah, and you can't, you can't portray your life as like a, cause a lot of people, I feel like they watch movies and see like this fairy tale ending and all mm -hmm. this stuff. Mm -hmm. That's just fake. That's why it's a movie. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. Right. It's, it's not real life. <laughs> it's not real life. You know what I mean? Right. So you're going to have your good days where you win, but you're going to take more L's than you take wins. More yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's all about, it's all about that. The lesson, the lesson in the L, you know what I mean? So you get better. So, I yeah. love that. I love that after effect, bro. Right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, man. So yeah, bro, that's all I had. One thing I've been trying to pride myself on since I started this is making sure I give uh, guys flowers while they're still here. I feel like as black men, we don't do that enough. So man, yeah, man, everything that you've accomplished, um, just everything in your personal life that you, that you have went through and you're still here, um, you know, writing books and inspiring other people. I just want to like show you that love and give you your flowers, bro. You know, while we both still here, man. Yeah. I appreciate it, man. Like I said, and yes, I appreciate sir. you kind of I'm saying, asked me to come on the show. Like I said, it was just, it was a blessing. It was like, cause right now it was funny. Cause like I was going through some things right now, but then when you hit me, I was like, man, like just give me an opportunity to talk about some things, just kind of share with a, you know, a fellow brother, you know what I mean? Because exactly. It, football community we all connected we all still yeah, talking man. football is family i always say that football is family <laughs> yeah just so we good just kind of catch up with you and just being on the show and i appreciate it for sure bro like, yeah listen, yeah i appreciate you man listen for real man i'm i'm gonna um message you my number i i may still have your number saved in my phone i'll check well, I but if you. i if i don't i'll message you um uh, you know so we can stay in contact yeah most definitely bro appreciate you man all right man appreciate you take it easy bro you, bro be easy Peace. so yeah if you've uh listened to the entire episode 80 i think dj if you listen to the whole thing, he has a very powerful story, not even talking about football and his football career, but more importantly, you know, his personal life, um, you know, f um, um, being born in Columbus, Ohio, and then flying to Nigeria, living there for 10 years, and then flying back, um, all the abuse and neglect he went through from his father, his mom passing, uh, unbeknownst to him, um, and him just having to keep navigating through the foster system and, and, and abuse and neglect. And finally finding sports and being good at that and going to junior college and then going to Wyoming, being his being the first high school graduate and college graduate in his family, uh, all the way to playing five years of arena, professional arena football. Then, you know, writing a book, um, which was called Fostering Dreams. It is available on Amazon. Go pick that up. Check out the reviews. It's, then yesterday. It's great. I'm, I'm going to have to grab one myself. Um, such, such, such a powerful story. This, this kind of episode really, really makes me um, grateful. guys like like that have stories like dj to come on and kind of like relive and rehash through that um and you know as kind of like a form of therapy so yeah if you've listened to this entire episode please rate us please leave a review as you know listenership is one of the ways that we make money if you've watched this on youtube please subscribe to lebron daniel tv please leave a comment uh please if you have a question and lastly merch 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 finally um took all the items to the shop so the t-shirts are getting printed the hats are getting embroidered. The stickers are being made. <laughs> uh, so yeah, just give me a couple more weeks for that stuff to come back from the shop. And then, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get our Shopify store ready. And hopefully, you know, um, you know, some of our guests and some of our listeners and watchers will, you know, buy some of the merch as we just continue to tell these organic, you know, sports um, stories. So yeah, to the next time, peace. Subscribe to LeBron Daniel TV. But you already knew that. Where we dig deep and find our hustle. And every single day, we are better than yesterday. Subscribe.